So if, if you love animals, if you're concerned about the environment, if you want to be healthy, if you want to feed the world's hungry, then I'd ask that, you know, just, just please place any prejudices you might, you may or may not have aside and, and listen. I'm not going to swindle you. I'm not going to make up any figures because I don't have to. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily Moran Barwick. I am an activist, an artist, and an educator. I created the YouTube channel and website Bite Size Vegan, and I attempt to educate people about veganism in uh, friendly and digestible vegan nugget videos, is, is what I call them. So since we're at a vegan festival, I'm going to assume that everyone here is either vegan, uh, interested in becoming vegan, you might have been brought here by a family or a loved one or you got lost in the woods and you just kind of ended up here. <laughs> so this isn't like a test or a judgment or a time to kind of like look around and see what everyone answers, but just for my own knowledge to kind of shape my talk, can I just get a show of, of who is already vegan? Now I know who to glare at in contempt. It's <laughs> few of you, I'm just kidding. So I'm hoping that this talk will be effective for non-vegans and vegans alike. If you are vegan, I might still talk about things that you're not you know, familiar with or maybe in, in a different way than what you're familiar with, or perhaps help you learn ways to talk to non-vegans about veganism. If you are non-vegan, I'm not here to impose anything you know, upon you or force anything upon you. I'm here to kind of to help help show what's really going on and and I would say that I'm here if I can be so presumptuous to to help you live the values that you already have. Most people identify themselves as animal lovers and even I think up to 60% of Americans identify themselves as environmentalists and most people are concerned with their health and living a long, healthy, happy life and I would think most people are also concerned about world hunger. So not only does veganism align with all of these values, but it's our only hope for fixing the crises that are inherent within all of these things. So if, if you love animals, if you're concerned about the environment, if you want to be healthy, if you want to feed the world's hungry, then I'd ask that, you know, just, just please place any prejudices you might, you may or may not have aside and, and listen. I'm not going to swindle you. I'm not going to make up any figures because I don't have to. I'm going to be transparent with you. If I don't know something, I will tell you that because, uh, believe it or not, vegans don't know everything. I know that we, we like to sometimes think we do. So there are four main reasons that people go vegan, and we're going to touch on each one a little bit. There's you know, the health impact, which I'm only going to briefly address because there's many people here at this festival who can speak to this far better than I can. There's environmental impact. There's the sociological or human impact, and there's the moral or ethical impact. So before we start, I'm going to th be throwing out some numbers to help you kind of grasp the enormity of, of what it is that we're talking about today. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if you guys want, can try to, to match what they represent. Uh, if you're not a numbers person, don't worry, because we're going to talk about things that aren't all you know, numbers-based. So because it's really difficult for us to wrap our heads around incredibly large numbers, we're going to do like a, just a quick comparison. So one million seconds, if you've seen my videos, we, I've talked about this, is, uh, is 12 days. So a billion seconds would be, what, like 24, 48? Anyone have a, a guess? 31 years. So a trillion seconds is, don't worry, I would not be able to do this in my head, 31,688 years. So you can see that like there's an exponential difference between these, these numbers, I think, and sometimes it's really difficult for us to, to conceptualize that. So now that we've got a bit of a scale to work from here, here are some figures. So we're going we're gonna to kind of see what applies to these. So one of these is the number of humans killed in wars in all of human history, every single war. Uh, anyone have a guess which one this is? What the number is? Yeah, which one that? It's actually, it's one billion. Okay, and then the number of chickens killed in the United States in the year 2013. So one country, one year. One billion. Yeah, that's 8.6. Uh, we've got the number of people starving in the world right now. Uh, that's 795 million and the number of people we could currently feed with the food that we're creating right now this second. Um, the largest number you have on there. Almost. It's actually 10 billion. So we could feed 10 billion. The majority of that is, or half of that is going, is going to the animals that, that we consume. So the number of gallons per year for fracking in the United States. 
which is like the big environmental evil of. It's the 70 to 140 billion gallons every year in, in America. Uh, number of gallons per year for animal agriculture in America. Yeah, so that some of these have a pattern. And this is trillion, and again, remember, that's a, that's a big difference there. And then we have the percentage, these are, these are kind of guineas, percentage of CO2 emissions from all global transportation, like trains, planes, automobiles. Yep, 13%, the entire world. So, of course, the CO2 emissions for animal agriculture, 51. Now we've got number of humans to ever exist in the history of our entire species, ever. Yep, 107.6. So that leaves the number of fish we kill every single year, 2.8 trillion. So we can see here that we kill 2.7 trillion more fish every year than all humans that have ever existed, and that's a number that still escapes our comprehension. Like, there's just no way to, to cognitively understand what that even implies. 7.6 billion more chickens are killed in a single year in a single country than all humans who ever died from war. Uh, we have more than enough food to feed everyone in the world right now, but globally we give around half our crops to the animals that we eat. Animal agriculture is using between 486 to 1,000 times more water than fracking and is the leading cause of climate change. So as a species, we can see here we're killing our planet, we're killing trillions of other beings, and we're killing ourselves. And, and while eating animals may not cause all of the evils in the world and the problems, its impact reaches far beyond our dinner plates, as, as you can see here. So we're going to take a look at the, the four main reasons for, for veganism separately, and I'm going to do my best to address common questions and, and objections, because my hope is that you'll find that even if you're not vegan, veganism is consistent with your own ideals and morals already. Uh, most likely, it's very, very close to your, your core beliefs, as, as you are right now. As a note, I just want to let you guys know I'm not going to be showing anything overtly graphic in this presentation. There will be some images that might be sad and, and possibly disturbing, but nothing's going to pop out at you and nothing's going to be terribly graphic by any means. So most of us want, want to be good people. We do our best. You know, we, uh, Most of us would never want to violently harm an innocent being or cause others unspeakable pain. Most of us don't want to destroy the planet or, or literally take food from the mouths of starving children. You know, these are not actions that, that most of us would condone or jump at the chance to participate in. Uh, yet most of us, and by this I mean the human race, are doing exactly this. You know, and I honestly believe that the vast majority of people who consume animals and their byproducts are not doing so out of malice or inherent evil. But, but out of ignorance of the truth. And, and that's why I've dedicated you know, my life to helping people see these realities. Because if we, truly, if we truly want to live according to our values and, and be the good people that we strive to be, we must educate ourselves about the truth and make decisions that are based on facts rather than fantasy. So we're going to dive into some facts. Again, if you're not a numbers person, bear with me through a couple figures. We're going to get to the not some non-numbers stuff as well because everyone learns differently. So we're going to start with something most people get, can get behind, and that's solving world hunger. Not everyone is an animal activist or even believes that animals should have equal rights to humans. Not everyone even really cares about the environment. But most people seem to agree that starving children deserve to eat. So we've all seen the commercials where you can donate you know, a dollar to feed a, a child in some developing country. The reality is the reason that these children don't have food is because the food's going to the animals that, that then we as a, as a race are consuming. As I said in our numbers game, we currently grow enough food to feed 10 billion people. And that means the world's population and then even more. The United States alone could feed 800 million people with the grain that we currently feed to our livestock. So the problem isn't a lack of food. The problem is that we're feeding our food to our food. If the world adopted a vegan plant-based diet, you know, we'd have world hunger solved. And it's, it's pretty simple, really. And if we do care about the starving people of the world, we need to stop stealing their food to feed our food and just eat the plants that we are already making. <coughs> So this brings me to the really, the really only health point that I'm going to make. As I said, there are experts here and, and medical experts that you can find online who are far more skilled in this area than I am. I do have an entire vegan nutrition series on my channel with the wonderful Dr. Michael Greger of NutritionFacts.org. If you want to reference that for more information, that will also be on the resource sheet for this talk. But a simple way of looking at the health aspect, particularly when it comes to concerns about not getting X, Y, or Z nutrient, is that when we eat animals, we are filtering our nutrition through them. So we're eating what I like to call hand-me-down nutrition. 
And with hand-me-downs always comes wear and tear and, and weird smells. So what I mean is that when someone asks, like, where do you get your protein if not from meat? Or where do you get your dairy if not from, you know, milk? What I like to ask people is where did, you know, the meat get its protein from? And where did the dairy cow get her calcium from? Invariably, the answer is plants. And when we try to get these nutrients through the animals, we're getting a lot more than we bargain for. You know, we're also getting the fat, we're getting the cholesterol, we're getting the acid-forming compounds that wreak havoc on our bodies. So let's just cut out the middle animal and go to the source. And so that's, you know, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about with health. But now we're going to talk a little, just briefly on the environmental aspect as well. I have, a, I have a whole video that breaks this down in great, great detail with a, a lot of numbers and snarkiness called Everything Wrong with Environmentalism. That will also be linked for you to check out later. In short, though, our, our planet is in crisis. You know, we cannot sustain the way that we're eating. Animal agriculture, as we've talked about, is the leading cause of climate change. As we saw, it's responsible for up to 51% of CO2, CO2 emissions compared to the 13% of all global transportation. It also uses a third of the Earth's fresh water, up to 45% of the Earth's land. And it's responsible for an incredible 91% of Amazon destruction, with one to two acres being cleared every second. For, for animal agriculture. It's also the leading cause, one of the leading causes of species extinction, ocean dead zones, and habitat destruction. So the efforts that we make to recycle or shower less are, are rather insignificant in comparison when we really look at this impact. So something astounding, a single pound of beef takes 2,500 gallons of water to create and 16 pounds of grain, which is where our food is going, as, as we've learned. So using the average American consumption of dairy and eggs for the year 2000, which was the, the most current year with the most thorough data that I could find, to match the water savings alone, not even talking about other aspects of being vegan for one year, you would have to not shower at all for 66 years if you took daily 15-minute showers or close to 100 years if you took daily 10-minute showers, both with water-saving shower heads. And this isn't even getting in depth with uh, species extinction, land and water pollution, the Amazon rainforest destruction, and all the other ways that animal agriculture is, is decimating our planet. But here's the takeaway from the environmental reasoning for veganism. We, we've reached a point beyond personal choice, beyond you eat how you want to eat and I'll eat how I want to eat. This is a global crisis and it's, it's not about you or me anymore. We say that children are our future, but what future can they have when we're eating the planet to death? So the world, the world cannot sustain meat, dairy, and egg production. It just simply can't. And this, this isn't propaganda. It's, it's just it's a truth that's even more inconvenient than Al Gore. So. The solution to this, luckily, is so simple. I mean, it's something that everyone, every single person can do. You know, we may not be able to single-handedly stop oil drilling in Alaska or get companies to cut their carbon emissions, but each and every one of us can choose what we put in our bodies and where we spend our money. You know, so we can literally save the planet one meal at a time. And that's, I mean, that's pretty mind, mind blowing. It's like it's a people's revolution in the, in the purest sense of the word. So now I'd like, I'd like to move into what I personally find the most important aspect of veganism, and, and that's the moral and ethical impact. As a species, we have a very large and an impressively resilient disconnect with how our food is made. We may understand, of course, that hamburgers come from cows and, and bacon comes from pigs, but what that actually entails, we prefer to keep in the dark. So our reasons are many, but the main ones seem to be that we have to eat animals and byproducts because of their nutrition, or that it's natural for us, it's written in our genes, it's in our biology, you know, our ancestors look, ate meat, you know, like look at my canines, all of those, or that, you know, animals eat other animals and it's the circle of life. If you can go fell a gazelle with nothing but your bare hands and teeth, then yes, eating meat is natural for you. If you can bite into the hide of a living cow and enjoy the blood, the lymph, the fat, the bones, the tendons, then yes, eating meat is natural for you. If you see roadkill and you get the munchies, then yes, perhaps <laughs> eating meat is, you're, maybe you're meant to eat meat. But we have to look at how we eat animals. You know, we have to hide the whole process. We only interact with sterilized, disguised, packaged remnants, and then we cook it, we slather it with spices and glazes and all kinds of crap, and then we think to ourselves, like, how primal am I? I'm so in touch with my ancestors. You know, and maybe that's not you. Perhaps you don't agree with, with factory farming, and you only eat, you know, the cage-free eggs and the grass-fed beef. But then all of these reasons lies the heart of our disconnect. We're going against our very natures and, and who most of us believe ourselves to be, you know, compassionate, good people who would never harm an innocent creature. 
I mean, we're animal lovers, after all. Well, that's, I mean, that's a whole area unto itself. If, if there's one thing that unites humanity across all colors, races, creeds, religions, cultures, whatever, is that we love certain animals and we eat other animals. If you live in the West, you love dogs and, and cats and you eat cows, pigs, and chickens. If you're a Hindu in India, you, you love the cows, but you abstain from all flesh, but you eat dairy. If, if you're in one culture, you eat dogs and dolphins, and in another culture, you shun the flesh of pigs. But favoring one group of animals over another is as universal as it is arbitrary. When we take a step back from our cultural ideals about eating animals, there is nothing worse about eating a dog than eating a cow or a dolphin than a chicken. It's just based on our conditioning. I mean, what makes one okay to eat and the other is abhorrent? And, and is it because dogs are meant to be pets and cows are raised to be eaten? But, I mean, you have to think, tell me, like, how does being raised for food make it okay to be killed? If I raised my dog for food, or God forbid I raised a child with the intention of killing it for food, does that, how does my intention make that death any more excusable? And how is it any less horrific for the, the individual who's dying? So, I mean, we're talking about taking a life here. And, and there's a perception that animals sacrifice their lives for us. The circle of life, they die so that we may live. But all you have to do is look into the eyes of an animal that's awaiting slaughter, and you see, you see the terror and the panic. You watch them fight to the very last second of their lives to know that they are not willing participants in this. No matter how it's done, killing an animal is killing a being who very much wants to live, just as you and I do, our dogs and our cats do. Killing is never humane, it's never gentle, it's never kind, not even when it's labeled cage-free, free-range, or humane. Free-range chickens can be crammed in sheds one on top of another with a little screen door so that they can see outside but not actually go outside, and that legally that is free-range. These labels only bring comfort to consumers, not to the animals. So, I mean, just put yourself in their place and, and tell me, like, how would I have to treat you to make it okay for me to kill you? I mean, it, it's just, it's absurd when we look at it in that way. So the insanity of all of this is that we don't need to kill animals. We're better off letting them live for our health, for the planet, for the hungry, and certainly for the animals themselves. And, and don't worry, they're not going to overrun us if we don't eat them because we won't be breeding them anymore. You know, the food industry, like any industry, runs on supply and demand. Stop demanding, they're going to stop supplying. The consumers have the power here. All that we have to do is take it. So I'd like, I'd like to touch on dairy and eggs and some of the, the less discussed aspects of veganism. A lot of people will say, oh, I'll just going to go vegetarian. And, and usually this is with the best of intentions. Many people don't know that dairy and eggs are far crueler than meat is. I think most of us grew up with the idea that, that cows just make milk constantly, so milking them isn't bad and possibly even beneficial to them. In reality, cows' bodies in this manner work very much like our bodies. They produce milk after they've given birth, they carry their babies for nine months just like we do, they lactate just like we do, and then they stop just like we do. So to get a cow's milk, she has to be repeatedly inseminated, which is a nice word for raped. The device used to secure the cow is literally referred to within the dairy industry as a rape rack, so this is not a term that's been dreamed up by activists. Once a cow gives birth, her baby is taken away from her, and if he's male, he's sent to the veal industry. Now, I dare say that most non-vegans are even against veal. The calves are tied down, they're unable to move, and then they're slaughtered when they're only weeks old. But veal would not exist without dairy. Every cup of yogurt, every scoop of ice cream, it's tied to the, beth, to the death of these baby calves. And the mother cows experience a horrific agony all of their own. Now cows bond intensely with their calves and they will cry for days when they are taken. A former cattle rancher friend of mine, she turned vegan when she witnessed her cows chasing the trailer as it took their children away. She says they cried for days and they only stopped when they lost their voices. This is not anthropomorphizing. This is a mother's grief, and it's utterly heartbreaking to watch. So after being forced into pregnancy after pregnancy, having their children violently taken, getting infections from frequent milkings, the mothers of the dairy industry finally give out when they're about four or five years old, and they're termed spent. Allowed to live free of this exploitation, cows can live up to 20 years or more. But their bodies give out decades before their time, and the dairy cows are then slaughtered for cheap meats and pet foods. Now, on a, on a lighter note with all of this, uh, you kind of have to think about the absurdity of drinking milk from a cow. So, I mean, like, who decided this was the animal to suckle from? 
amongst every other animal. You know, I, I imagine some guy in a field who's eyeing like a cow, a wild dog, maybe a moose, and then he says, that's the one, you know? Uh, no other animal is weaned from their mother and then says, now I'm old enough to go suck on the boob of another animal. Like, cow's milk makes no sense for us. It's nutritionally designed to grow baby cow into a thousand pound plus adult rather quickly too, but our, our nutritional needs are completely different and, and rather than help us grow big and strong, milk and dairy cause serious damage to our systems. Now as a bonus, the infections that cows get from the frequent milkings transfer to their milk. So there's actually a legally allowable amount of pus in milk, which they call the somatic cell count. And there's also antibiotics and feces in there, so it's basically pus, poop, and drugs which kind of makes you think, rethink like rocking the milk mustache a little bit. So now we're gonna, we're gonna touch on eggs really, really quick. Um, eggs are one of the hardest for people to grasp ethically, I believe. We don't have to impregnate the chickens, they're just gonna you know, spit these out anyways, right? And in a sense, yes, they, they do, but layer hens suffer. You know, they're crammed into these battery cages on top of one another, they're driven to cannibalism, literally pecking each other to death. And, and as I said earlier, the cage-free farms really aren't any better. The farmers manipulate the light and the temperature of the coops uh, to trick the chickens into these unnatural biological rhythms so that they're going to produce far more eggs than is natural and all the while depleting their bodies of nutrients so that they also are going to be dying prematurely called spent once again by the industry. But the darkest part of egg production is what happens to the chicks. You see, we've, we've segmented our animals and we've, we've genetically manipulated them to such an extent that we only have two kinds of chickens. We have layers and we have broilers. The broilers are the ones we eat, the layers are the ones that give us the eggs. And the broilers, as an aside, are, are made to grow so insanely fast that they're slaughtered at about 42, 43 days old. So the full-grown looking chicken carcasses you can buy are actually babies. But back to the layer chicks. So in order to have this, this consistent supply of eggs, we have to have more layer hens, because, especially because their life expectancy is so low. But we only need the females. The males have no place in the egg industry because they're not broilers, so we can't eat them. And it's a regular practice, and by regular I mean on an international scale, to throw them into a grinder alive. So they're also sometimes smothered alive by being dumped into trash cans. By some estimates, billions to trillions of newborn chicks are disposed this way every year. And I say estimates because we don't even care enough to keep track of this. So how can we, good people, animal lovers, pay people to grind up baby chicks when they're fully conscious? How is that something that we can start our days with? What, I mean, what kind of person does that or what kind of person pays for that while refusing to take any responsibility? Now on to a less horrifying but slightly more disgusting side of the egg issue. The eggs are basically a chicken's period when you think about it. I mean, chickens only have one hole called a cloaca, and from that hole they poop, they pee, they secrete fluids, and they pop out eggs. And I don't know about you, but I, I prefer my food not to come out of a glorified anal-vaginal combo. Thank you very much. Now, and just, just to kind of touch, like I said, on some of the more fringe areas of veganism, I do have videos on my channel and website addressing wool, honey, silk, and fish. And you can look into those for more information. But I would like to start wrapping up so I, I can take any questions that you guys have. But first, I wanted to play a short video. I was going to show a graphic video when I first was planning this talk, but I've decided instead to show one that is not graphic. I do, however, want to say that I think watching graphic footage meeting the reality of our food industry is absolutely vital for those who choose to continue in consuming animal products for a number of reasons. First, most people will not believe it until they see it. Number two, we have to, if we choose to eat animals and their byproducts, like we should know what it is that we're supporting. And number three, these animals deserve to have their stories told because these are stories that we as a society go through great pains to hide from ourselves. And if you don't believe some of the things I've mentioned today or you want to see them for, their, for yourself, again, please do contact me through my website or email and I can send you footage. If you do eat animal products but can't handle watching the footage of these products being made, I would just ask you to meditate on the question, if it's not good enough for your eyes, why is it good enough for your stomach? That said, this video is, is not graphic, but I feel that it effectively captures the horrors of the animal products industry and conveys in two minutes more than I have in this entire talk.
we cannot watch that and see that the animals that we kill for our food don't know any better or that they die peacefully and humanely. They can sense the fear, they can smell the blood, and they fight. You know, they fight to the end. In my years of being vegan and speaking with many, many non-vegans, I have yet to hear one reason that even comes close to justifying putting a sentient being through what we just watched. Not one. You know, we don't, we don't need to eat animals. We, we benefit in every conceivable way from not eating them. The good news is, being vegan doesn't mean that you have to give up taste or even give up your favorite foods. You know, these days there exist vegan alternatives for every meat, every cheese, dairy, creation, even eggs. And you can find recipes for making your own, even if the, you don't have the ready-made alternatives in your area or maybe they're too expensive. And I'm not here to say anything against eating a whole foods, fresh, organic produce diet, which will do wonders for your health. But the truth is the animals don't care what we eat as long as it's not them. And the planet doesn't care as long as it's not being destroyed. So yes, you could be a junk food vegan. Is it the best thing for your body? Probably not. But veganism has many options and rooms for a multitude of dietary approaches that are all equally ethical. Veganism is the most powerful tool that we have for saving our planet, for ending world hunger, for improving our health when we eat health consciously, and for regaining our compassion, for becoming the people that we believe ourselves to be, good people. And good people don't take food from the mouths of starving children. Good people don't destroy the planet, leaving our children futureless. Good people don't kill newborn babies. Good people don't rape, torture, or murder. Yet good people everywhere are doing all of these things with every single bite. But we have the power to stop all of this, and that is the beauty of veganism. It happens on an individual basis. You are the change. You, you decide what goes in your body. You decide whether you want to continue to have others kill for you. You decide whether you want to continue consuming death, terror, and heartbreak. You decide. And my, my hope is that you'll decide to go vegan. Thank you. Hi, it's Emily from Bite Size Vegan, and I wanted to thank you for watching this talk. Thank you for listening, and even more important, for hearing. If you enjoyed this talk, if it reached you in any way, please share it around so it may reach others. You can find the blog post for this speech, which contains academic citations of every fact and figure I relayed, as well as a list of additional resources, linked up in the sidebar there and below in the video description. There was a Q&A session following my speech, which will also be posted on my channel and website, and linked at the end of this video as well as in the video description below and the sidebar. You can also search my website at bitesizevegan.com or my channel here on YouTube for topics I've already covered, and always feel free to contact me with questions. Though do know that I receive a lot of emails and I answer each one personally, so response time is slower than I would like. Please give the video a thumbs up if you found it helpful, and if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you as a subscriber. Here at Bite Size Vegan, I post videos every Monday and Wednesday, and some Fridays, so do hit the subscribe button if you want more helpful vegan content. Thank you for your time. Now go live vegan, and I'll see you soon. You are the change. You, you decide what goes in your body. You decide whether you want to continue to have others kill for you. You decide whether you want to continue consuming death, terror, and heartbreak. You decide. And my, my hope is that you'll decide to go vegan.